I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh. Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> the Dinosaur Hour. Uh. Sundays at 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. Now, this is a new show aimed at an enormous demographic, the out-of-touch. But the out-of-touch who have chosen to stay out-of-touch and the out-of-touch who don't even know that they are. So, if you're looking for photographs of reality stars' breakfasts or details of the latest trans person's bicycle accident or for a fun story about an old woman who hasn't sneezed for 70 years, this is not the show for you. It's just a lot of very dollary old fools making it up as we go along. However, the good news is there'll be lots of cats. <laughs> Now, I want to show you something. Um, there's an organisation called the European Broadcasting Union, and every year they ask 1,000 people in each European country about whether they trust the printed press in that country. So, let's look at some of the recent results. Here's 2009. Uh, most trusted, Luxembourg, Portugal, Czech Republic, Netherlands, Austria, so forth. Um, down here, we're getting to Poland and North Macedonia, Latvia. And then, right at the bottom here, last, and by all means least, the United Kingdom. Let's see 2010. Now, here we go again, Netherlands, Austria, and all that. And down here at the bottom, in last place, the United Kingdom. Let's do 2011. No, we're still down at the bottom in 2011. Lowest degree of trust in printed media in Europe, the United Kingdom. 2012, please. Ah! Oh, we've gone up one. We've gone above Greece. Oh, that's terrific. Fleet Street's heart must be swelling with pride. 2013? Oh, we're down again. 2014? 2015? 2016, oh, come on, 2017, 2018, two... <laughs> Look! We're above, we're above North Macedonia and Greece. Oh, makes you proud to be English. Let's see 2019. Uh, oh. It's not very good, really, is it? So why is trust so low in British newspapers? I think we need an expert, and fortunately we've got one. He's a professor of communications at the University of Westminster, and he's Steve Barnett, and he's actually rather nice. Ah, you've got a kitty, do you like it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand the kitty over to you. <laughs> you, I'm you can be, I'm you can be the kitty. You're the Bond villain. Now, tell me, uh, Steve, why is trust so low in printed media? And I think there, there are essentially two reasons. The first is that we have long had a tradition in the UK that our broadcast journalism are bound by rules of accuracy and impartiality. Our broadcast? Yeah. So if, if, you're, if you're working in broadcasting, you know that there are rules that you've got to tell the truth, you've got to back it up with facts, but also you've got to give both sides of the argument. Um, whereas at the press, for generations, you can essentially say what you want. Now, there's nothing wrong with being opinionated. As long as people are aware that there is a difference between the news pages, where you expect to see facts, and yes. the opinion pages, where people can sound off and say anything they want. But I think the other reason... Uh, thank you. The other reason is 
the complete lack of any genuine regulation in the press. Uh -huh. So in broadcast journalism, you know that if you get it wrong, badly wrong, uh, and if you start sounding off with your opinions, people will complain to Ofcom, which is the regulator for broadcasting. Ofcom has teeth, it was set up by statute, and it will deliver on complaints that are genuine and have merit. Now, it's had a lot of criticism recently, Ofcom. Uh, it's, it's had some criticism, not least, I have to say, in terms of what it's not doing with GB News. <laughs> Free speech! We'll, we'll part Free that speech. one. We'll part that one. Um, so that's true, it, and, uh, and it is under pressure because there are you know, new broadcast stations which do appear to be very opinionated. But that's a new issue. For the press, we're talking about decades of people simply not having anywhere to go. If they want to make a complaint, a genuine complaint, there is a real problem or there's a real abuse of editorial standards. Because and that's, suing is not really an option. Well, that's the other thing. Uh, if, if the newspaper tells blatant lies about you, yes, if you've got the money, you can go to court, but how many people have actually got enough cash behind them? It costs a lot of money. Do you know how many press inquiries we've had in the last 75 years? I'm going to guess it's seven. I knew you'd know the answer. Absolutely right. So seven separate inquiries into the behaviour of the press, each one on the back of abuses of editorial standards, each time coming up with very sensible, moderate recommendations for how things might change. And every single time, the government of the day has run a million miles away because, because they're afraid, they're fear. frightened. And that's why you had Tony Blair in the 1990s flying to the other side of the world to meet Rupert. First thing he did when he became PM. Yep. yep. No, no, when he became opposition leader. Oh! As opposition leader in the 95, 96, he flew to the other side of the world to, to speak at Rupert Murdoch's conference yeah. because he wanted to make sure that Rupert was on side. David Cameron became opposition leader, goes and meets Rupert Murdoch on a yacht somewhere in, in Greece. Yeah. And that is what they were, their, their belief, their, 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 their conviction is that these are the people, the power brokers, without whom they will not get into power. Yeah. So they run a mile in the other direction. So is there any chance that we're going to reverse this? I well, mean, if the, uh, uh, the, the eighth attempt, are the government going to be any less frightened? Well, let, if we go back to the seventh attempt, which was Leveson, mm -hmm. and the stories, some of the stories that we heard, which were truly appalling, we think of phone hacking. Phone hacking wasn't even the half of it. So he publishes his recommendations, very moderate. It's just a sort of a regulator that, that is being um, sort of supervised, that is, is sort of someone's looking over its shoulder to make sure it's doing the job. No interference in free speech or the press or anything like that. And Parliament passes the first stage. Yes. And then the government gets frightened. And Cameron obviously has conversations with editors. And he stands up in Parliament and says, we're not going to complete this. Yes, that's right. It's the same story over and over again. So coming back to your question, is anything ever going to happen? Yeah. I actually think that we're getting to the point now and we've, we've got three lots of phone hacking uh, litigation still going on. We've got more stuff coming out and more stuff that's going to come out, not just the sun, but the mail, the mirror... And I think people are beginning to realise that this is just... some of this is, is burglary. Yeah, absolutely. The, the burglary there are is... allegations, which I, I certainly believe are burglary, of where they're paying people to break into people's houses and cars, yep. Yep. to steal documents and also to put microphones. Absolutely. And so forget about phone hacking. We're talking about bugging live conversations. Yeah. We're talking about putting bugs in cars yeah. so that you can follow them and listen to what's being said. As you say, commissioning, burglary, commissioning PIs, private investigators, to follow people. All of this is incredibly intrusive. I think we're reaching the point, and particularly there is a sort of shift in the political environment now. I think there's going to be a change of government over the next two years. The real question is whether a new government, which is going to be certainly somewhere to the left of the current one, right. under Starmer, or whoever is finally prepared to do something, or whether they are still so frightened that they're going to say, no, we're, we're, we're going to leave things as they are. So tell me finally, why does it matter so much? I, I, I think that's, that's really important, because some people will look at this and will go, it's journalism. I mean, you know, 
so what? You know, if, if you're an architect and you break the rules, then your building falls down and somebody might die. That's yeah. important. This is just journalism. And I, th there are two reasons. First of all, because we actually rely on people telling us the truth for, a, 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 for democracy to work. But I think there's actually a much more important reason, which is that these people ruin other people's lives. Oh. It's as much about clicks on social media yeah. and on the internet as it is about what's in the newspaper. Well, I'm going to talk to someone whose uh, life was ruined, and uh, then I'm going to be back to talk some more to you. I'll look forward yeah. to it. I'll get you a cat. <laughs> I think most people assume that the majority of people worked over by the press are celebrities. Not true. The majority of the people worked over by the press are not celebrities. And I have here with me now someone whose business was ruined by the British press, Daniel Hindley. Now, you, you had a, a nail salon, is that the right? Um, yeah, I do a lot of different treatments in hair, nails, beauty, a little bit of aesthetics and semi-permanent makeup. Tell me the story. Um, so, the back end of 2017, um, I had a journalist come into my home with a hidden camera pretending to be a client and she was asking strange questions that clients don't ask. It was only the next day after I couldn't stop thinking about this woman that had been in my house I just because I knew she wasn't a client. She'd text me by, from her phone number to book it so I googled her phone number and it came up straight away, Charlotte Waste, Daily Mail reporter. Oh. And, yeah. So, first of all, I contacted the police cos I thought she'd been in my home. I, by this point, I didn't just check who she was. I looked at some of her other articles that she'd done and she'd done some other questionable articles in, in the beauty industry. Then I started looking at some of the articles and there were photos on the articles that you could tell were screenshots from hidden cameras. And I remember when she was in my house, she kept shuffling about and her body language was really strange and it just suddenly dawned on me, I thought, you've had a hidden camera in my house. So first of all, I contacted the police and I said, look, I've had a journalist in my home. She had a hidden camera on my, in my house. My son at one point came downstairs into my workroom in his underwear cos he'd just got out the shower. So I was like, listen, I'm, I'm not happy for somebody to film my child. And the police were basically like, listen, journalists can do what they want. Like, we can't, we don't have any way of dealing with him. Once they printed the article, my business was done. So what happened? They printed the article and it said what? They said that um, I disfigured a client, which is untrue. They said that I was not qualified, that I wasn't insured, that I wasn't licensed. Um, and basically just... They basically called me a rogue beautician, a cowboy cosmetic. They made people scared to come to me and they made me out to be a criminal. It was a double-page spread. It had photos of me. It told them the village that I lived in, so everyone in the village was calling me scum. Oh. Um, yeah, like... <clears throat> like, my neighbours were shouting scum at me and stuff, cos I live in a really nice little village. And um, they were... Oh, my God, they were trolling me like you wouldn't believe. You'd thought I'd killed somebody the way they were trolling me. Every beautician, I think, in England that ever saw, thought I was some sort of competition were loving it. I had customers that had come to me for years mm. and it's affected some of my family relationships now forever. You know, I don't have any relationship with my mother or my siblings and that ultimately is because of that article and <clears throat> because people believe what they read. If I hadn't have proved yeah. in the way that I did, if I hadn't have gone to it, so and then if I hadn't have then gone a step further and, and you know, taken a libel case to the mail and won, I don't think my business would have recovered. And if I'm being completely honest, I don't think I would be here now either. Yeah. I had... So tell me about the libel case. Um, so when... When I'd, once the Ipso had upheld my case, upheld my complaint, which they didn't do a good job, but they upheld the most important bit. They which, did uphold it? Yeah, I was one of the less than 1% that they upheld, but they didn't have a choice, John. I emailed them every single day for eight months. 
and I, I told them how bad it was affecting my health. I told them that I was suicidal. I made it very clear that I wasn't going to go away until they made them print the Good truth. And then when they upheld the complaint, they said the mail had to print a correction on page two of the mail on Sunday. Page two? Yep. Come on. It wasn't printed on page two. No. They had a more important story about Harry and Meghan, apparently. What they'd printed about me initially was a double-page spread. Yeah. And the correction... Is this side. A little sentence. The tiniest sentence. I couldn't even find it. My friend found it and she was like, oh, they have printed it, I found it. <laughs> Nobody could find it. Oh, it was a hilarious. And also, nobody was talking about that. When I was, yeah. you know, putting all over social media, yay, they've printed a correction, nobody gave a damn. When you sat down, you said, you know, the paper ruined your business. The paper ruined my mental health. My business will survive because I'm very good at my job. My business came back and my business is OK. What they did to my mental health was unforgivable. My son nearly ended up without a mother because of mm. that. Um, because I didn't leave my bedroom for months. Like, <clears throat> when it was before I even... So I'd... When it was all ongoing, I think this was just when I was dealing with it, so I did not leave my bedroom. I didn't shower. I didn't brush my teeth. I didn't eat. I was living on cups of tea. Cups of tea that my child was making for me. Yeah, I cost them a lot of money, I did. But no matter how much money they had to spend on their legal fees, my legal fees and my compensation, it was never going to be enough to make what they did to me and my son OK. Mm. It'll never be OK, and that's why I still do things like this where I do speak about it, because there's a lot of people... This, this, Because the way media law is set up, it's not set up to help people like me. No. My case cost hundreds of thousands in legal fees. I didn't have that money to do that. I was just fortunate enough that I came across a lawyer who basically was my hero. Act Off put me in touch with him. He's called Jonathan Code. He asked me what happened and I told him. And he said, um, there's not really any such thing. There's no win, no fee in media law. He said, but I'm going to do something for you. He said, I'm going to take on your case and I'm going to help you. I said, listen, I've researched you and I know that you deal with royal family, you deal with celebrities. You don't need my case. Like, why have you taken my case on? And he said, <laughs> because I'm a devout Christian and you need me. And I thought, wow, because <clears throat> I used to go to bed every night during this period and I'm not religious, but I went to bed every night and I got on my knees and I begged and I prayed and I said, you need to send somebody to help me because I didn't know what to do. And um, so then when he said that to me, I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> I might have to start going to church. Well, at least there are some, <laughs> some decent people around, yeah. right, even if they're not Fleet Street editors. Yeah. Danielle, I just want to thank you for telling us this. And yeah. It's very touching. Thank you. Yeah. And thank Jonathan Code, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask uh, Steve Barnett what he makes of all that. So, Steve, how did you react to that? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've seen Danielle tell her story a couple of times, and I have to say, every single time it gets me. I mean, mm. first of all, the courage of the woman... Yeah. ..to go through what she went to and then be able to tell it the way she tells it. But I think it's important to remember that for every Danielle, there'll be 10, 15, 20 others who don't have the courage, the bravery, yeah. who would just give in. When they're told you don't sue the male, they don't. Yeah. Whereas, you know, Danielle, being the sort of person she is, she takes that as a challenge. Yeah. And, and I'm delighted that Hacked Off were able to help and that Jonathan was yes. able to help. Yes. And she got the justice she deserved. But she should not have had to go through that for the sake of a story. It's, yeah. it's pure bullying. So given that the last seven attempts to reform the press have collapsed because the government was frightened of the press, do you see anything optimistic? I'm an optimist by nature. So That's not the question I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think that, that actually times are changing. 
And I do think that with a change of government, that when people look at the detail of the cases that are coming out now, the hacking, the, 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 the PIs, the burglary, the, the phone tapping, etc., they'll go, they'll say enough is enough. Amen to that. We'll see. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very, very much. Right. I know you, uh, Chris. Chris what? Chris Tarrant. Tarrant, yes. What are you doing here? Well, I'm playing strip poker with these three. Go away. <laughs> I'm Andrew Doyle, executive producer of The Dinosaur Hour, and Louis Schaefer with me here. You were the maitre d' in The Dinosaur Hour. No, I was the star of the entire show, and I think people are going to see that when they uh, You were, they're but we, see we cut you out a lot. You, you know, know what? If my mother was still living, she would, like, be furious. She would, but she's she not, would. and I knew that that was okay. No, but I am in, I am in the uh, opening... I hope you don't cut out the opening section. No, you're in the opening section. I'm in the opening but, section. And, of course, working with John Cleese, that must be uh, exciting. Well, that was... That was amazing, really. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but then I'm, I'm sitting there working with him. I'm thinking, this is John Cleese. Yeah. This is John Cleese, as in cheese. He's and you got, got to get that yeah. right. He, he hate in America yeah. they call him Cleese. Yeah. And he really has a problem with that. But you're an American and you're getting it right. Well, my name is Schaefer. People say Schaefer. You just got to get used to it <laughs> or change your name to something that everybody pronounces. Yeah. Properly. People normally get mine right. Although I was called Andrew Boyle yeah. by a critic once. It made me angry. Uh, because that's the, probably the first time that's ever happened to you. With yeah. me, my name has been misspelled. I remember one time I noticed my name was spelled correctly at a restaurant, and I was like, it was maybe it was in my 30s, and I was like shocked <laughs> because it never happens. But John, please. John, please. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the great thing about the show was to be able to make the show that he wanted to make, which was talking to the people that he found interesting uh, about the subjects that he found interesting. And that yeah. isn't something that normally uh, is granted by television channels to stars. They normally tell them what they have to do, no. where they have to stand, yeah. all of that. Well, let's just f let's just hope that people he finds interesting are people we find interesting. Or that the audience finds interesting. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Well, I found them interesting. No, I found them interesting. Yeah. I have to find them interesting because I'm working with John Cleese. Yes. And as we're spending more time with the dude, I'm realizing, oh my God, this is... Yeah. This is John well, Cleese. Well, I mean, because Python was really big in America. It was really big in America. And um, I think it was real. I don't know if it was really big in America. It wasn't really big in America. It was big among college kids. Right. And okay. I was at university, college, university. I was at university at the time. And I remember, I remember we watched all the episodes and then we're waiting for the next thing to come out. And it, and it wasn't like, it, it was my first association with British television, whereas they don't produce as many episodes as they do in America. They don't. So, so you're sitting there waiting. John Cleese has unlimited patience. He does. Yeah, but with you, you're with me, with everybody. I, I, I don't have limits. I have very, I'm very impatient with you. I don't think you are. No, I think you're trying to do what's best for the show, and I think you just handle it in a in a, in a bad way. Yeah. He's 83 years old. He knows he knows what to do yes. with people, and a lot of the thing that on screen is him like saying I'm an idiot or stupid or whatever it is. Yes, and, and uh, I, I hope it comes across as being funny. I mean, I did cry afterwards. You did because but, there was an authenticity to it. Yeah, which I, I picked up on. But but in in our private dealings, he was very cordial. It's an odd place to film it. The castle in the middle of Essex it really was the middle yeah. of no, nowhere. I mean, there was nothing anywhere. You know, we we kept going to that same restaurant because there was only one yeah. restaurant in the village. Um, don't give the people the impression we were eating meals. But it was it was in the middle of nowhere, and I don't know why you chose it. I mean, you could have probably built a set for less money. We probably could. And it would have been closer, and you wouldn't have had to schlep people all the way to but, the middle. Well, Headington not, Castle. It's not very useful for you to tell me this now. Yeah. This is the kind of advice I could have had before. The show started. I t listen to me. I try to keep out of your business, Andrew. I'm so happy to be getting a job. My life was at the lowest point. You s you saved me. This is the thing yeah. I learned. About. Can I say one thing? You can say whatever you like. Yeah. What actual John Cleese? Less is more. I know that's. They say that about all the great actors. Yes. Yes, whereas your yeah. instinct is to overplay. Yes, because, yeah. I'm, because I'm an amateur and a failure. You're a drama queen. Yeah. But <laughs> Everything's got to be a drama with you. I'm more of a drama princess. I haven't re reached the queen stage. The Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese, on GB News.
Now, there haven't been many people doing anything much about this awful press of ours, but one group that I very much admire is called Hacked Off, and uh, the lady who sort of runs it is <laughs> Jackie Hames. I know you don't really run it, but it's much more interesting if I say that. Jackie, thank you for coming. Tell me about Hacked Off. You're very welcome, John. It's lovely to meet you. Um, hacked off... You well... don't have to be polite. You can be really rude to me. It's much more fun. <laughs> we'll come on to that later. OK. Um, no, it's, Hacked Off came... really was born out of um, all the revelations that uh, appeared in, um, after the hacking of the murdered schoolgirl... Millie Dowler's Millie phone. Dowler. So what year was that? So that would have been 2011. 11. Mm -hmm. um, a group of people sort of, thank you so much... Pay no attention. Uh, got, got, ..got together and thought... I mean, I wasn't involved then, but got together and thought, enough's enough. The people, you know, people who were really involved in this area, this sense of regulation and, and press and that type of thing and news, and they felt that they'd had enough and they felt there should be a public inquiry you know, the relationship between the press and the public, the press and the police, and the press and politicians. All right, so how did you get into Hacked Off? Well, as I was, you know, I worked, as well as being a police officer, I worked on a TV programme called Crime Watch for That's 16 right. years. six years. 16 years. 16? Yeah, 16 years. I've got to figure out how crime. old you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll make up a figure later, don't okay. worry. Well, and... I'm 83, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and as a result, a slightly public profile. But actually, it wasn't really because of that. My husband was investigating a murder which um, of a private investigator called Dan Daniel Morgan, and he was Daniel murdered. Daniel Morgan? He was investigating that one? Yeah, and as a result of being on that inquiry, um, we, it, it was discovered that we, as a family, would be under some sort of threat of, um, of them trying to influence the way he conducted that murder inquiry. And um, oh we were put under the umbrella of the witness protection scheme and it was all very difficult. But at one point we were put under surveillance thinking it was the people responsible for this axe murder. Um, but when they were stopped, it turned out they were... Um, paid for and um, employed by News of the World. And it turned out that they'd hacked our phones, they were putting us under surveillance, um, and, oh, yeah, I was, you know, it's, it is really like being in the Matrix film. You feel yeah. like you've entered an alternate universe. And, so, <laughs> and suddenly everything is looking really different and you're seeing things from a completely different perspective. So. When I was asked by Hacked Off to come and sign this petition for a public inquiry at that point, um, I said, yes, I think we really need to do, start to uncover what actually happened. But what do you do? Well, there's several uh, aspects to what we do. One is talking to politicians and lobbying and um, bringing a different perspective to the information sort of that persuasion. they give. Persuasion. Persuasion. Gentle persuasion of, of, and ideas as to how this... Um, problem can be solved. But we also do advocacy for victims, people like me, ordinary people, and people in the public eye who are really struggling to get any sort of justice. What I'm interested in is what's this regulatory body? I mean, it's called IPSO and it replaced the press complaints something or other? Press complaints commission, PCC. Commission, yeah. that's right. Uh, and that was dismantled. Mm after Leveson and replaced by Ipsa. When I say replaced, <laughs> tell us about Ipsa. Well, it was basically the same organisation. They just <laughs> literally the same building and they changed the... Same office. ..the sign right? over the door, effectively. <laughs> it's... I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't write this, as my comedic friends say. They, they just changed the name on the door. They get the same office. Well, that's what it kind of felt like to yeah. the rest of us. And then the, uh, the newspapers pay for this body that's supposed to regulate them. Mm. Right. And they, they write their editor's code, which is supposed to be a framework for, you know, their ethical conduct. And that, um, that code and is laid down by ten editors and three laypersons, yeah. right? So that sort of gives the press a little bit of an advantage. Advantage. Exactly. And these guys who decide whether it's a legitimate uh, complaint against the press are paid for by the press. Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's a Python sketch. It's marking their own homework. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I like that phrase. Ah, what a joke, hey? Frustrating. I mean, you have to laugh because it is so ridiculous. But Say something to cheer me up. Say something to cheer you up. We're here fighting, John. Ah. We're not going to give up. We've been here for 11 years and All we right. absolutely are not going to give up now. Hacked off, ladies and gentlemen. Look it up. All right. Thank you. Years ago, I used to read about hacking, but I never actually knew what it was until uh, this here hacked me. <laughs> <laughs> you naughty, naughty man. <laughs> yeah, but I would have never met you if I hadn't hacked you. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, that's very true. Anyway, you've come over from the dark side, so you're most welcome. Dano, tell me the hacking that you were involved in in my case. I had worked locally as a private investigator for, uh, started out working for Rupert Murdoch for a show, Current Affair, mm -hmm. and then went over to a show called Hard Copy, Inside Edition of America. I worked for these television tabloid shows. And, uh, and what were you doing for I was a private investigator. Whenever a story was breaking about whoever, they wanted me to track that person down so they could go and interview them or contact them. And I, uh, eventually got out of working for the American tabloids, and I was looking for work, so I started a company called British American News Service. Oh. And through word of mouth, I never advertised at all, journalists and what they call stringer journalists, uh, reporters for the various tabloids in, in London started calling me and asking me to locate people and then do background checks on them. And, background checks? Yeah, find out everything. Well, it never occurred to me at the time that uh, when you do a background check as a, as a private investigator, you get full details. You get their social security numbers, their driver's license, their date of birth, mother's maiden name, all that stuff, that that really shouldn't be used by journalists. That you should just give them where do they live, what's their phone number, and that's it. Because but, if they, if you give them the social security, then they number. can use that. How? Well, I, over here, I guess you call it blagging, but they can use that to pretend to be you. So, uh, in your case, they had people call up credit card companies and and say, "Oh, I lost my phone bill. You know, I need to get a copy." And as long as you can answer all the questions correctly. I don't know whether they even bother to impersonate your voice. They'll ask you, like, what's your mother's maiden well, name? Well, I met a, a, a blagger called John Ford, who I'm delighted to say used to go to my old school. Oh. And what he said was he would use lots of accents because he said the best way to get information out of people was to pretend that you were very stupid. And once they've got something like a social security number or the national uh, yeah. health number or something like that, they can ring up pretending that they're from a hospital or a bank, Absolutely, right? absolutely. They can pretend to be you or somebody connected to you and say, oh, I've lost this file, can you send me a copy of it? It became common practice to, to get your phone records, your credit card bills, uh, your text messages, everything, by pretending to be you. But what I want to know is, do you think the knowledge of this went right to the top? I oh, mean... absolutely. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they paid big money. I was making a quarter million dollars a year for quite a long time because I, could, I had a reputation that I could find out everything about anybody anywhere, and it didn't matter who they were. I had the Social Security numbers for the five fast past U.S. presidents. Oh! God. And all of their data. So I have one last question, sure. Donna. What did you find out about me? Well, <laughs> you're actually kind of boring. You know, when I was, uh, no, but they were very interested in one of your wives down in Texas. One of them? One oh, of, yeah, one yeah, them, yeah I know the one. Yeah. <laughs> Donna, thanks for coming along. That's I love great. It. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And then I, I kissed the nun. Um, you yeah. Did. Well, I, as you know, I'm. A, I'm in the film business myself. I've well, been on many, many... You should explain that to people, that you're not really in the film business. You, you, you are an extra. I am a supporting a, artist. Supporting artist. I'm but sorry, I have I had it. relatively large roles in some of these well, films. Well, you had a line in Wonder Woman, didn't you? I had a line what, in Wonder Woman. What was Woman. the line? Uh, we Have to See the President, something like you that. You do that very well. I, did I was very, convinced. Didn't you... people notice it? Whatever yeah. it is, don't belittle yeah. me, Andrew. I'm being sincere. These people don't know. No, I'm being sincere. You're interpreting me okay. and belittling you. I'm not. So I've been I'm, on... I'm impressed. I'm, I'm not listening to you. Okay. I've been on many film, shot, film, film shoots. Yes. And considering, not even considering this is your first time, you seem totally in control. What, as a producer? The, of a producer, yeah. totally in control. The director, of course, was competent and... And so I thought it was extremely... It was a professional set. It was a professional set. We do things set. professionally at GB News, that's the thing. And really well done. Yeah, well, Really thank you. well done. Oh. And I'm... I thought it was a little... I thought, I thought the production values... I thought if I had to do it, I would have saved a little bit of money and maybe not had cats, maybe not had extras. Well, I think the cats were quite integral to the whole ethos, you know. John was very keen yeah. on the cats. He John, John the has lots of cats. He does have lots of yeah. cats, and yeah. And so he wanted cats there. So, you know, whenever I say something controversial on Facebook, I always post a picture of a cat. It does actually mollify any situation yeah. instantly, doesn't it? It does. If, I'm, if I've been in lots of Twitter arguments, yeah. uh, what I do is I just put a cat video out there. Yeah. And it's like a cleanser. Yeah. And everyone just calms down. And we're and happy we've because seen cats. You can't retain anger and rage in the face of, of a, a cat. Like, you know, big furry face. You know? Right. You were on the New York comedy scene. Yeah. Then you came to the UK, and for some reason you stayed. For some reason I stayed. I wanted to see my children. Oh, it was because Basically, family Basically, yeah. yeah okay. I mean, I would have gone home if I didn't have any children, because I was... I, they, they liked me a li initially a little bit, and then they turned on me. What, the children or the audience? Everybody. <laughs> everybody. 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 This is... This is uh, British people think they're the funniest people on Earth, and you're not. You're not funny, as you can tell. He's not funny trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny. You are, you're trying to be funny, you can see. Here's, here's, sorry about this, Andrew. That's all right. Is that, is that, I think with Americans, we, Americans like to be loved. Is that right? And English people don't want to be loved. Do you know what, that is true. I noticed that with American comedians. There's a lot yeah. more sense of like me, like me, you know, yeah. like, uh, they're a lot more bubbly, whereas a lot of uh, British comedians are almost uh, standoffish. Yeah, well, like I, was thinking, for laughing at I was thinking more of the audience, is that the audience in this country, if you tell the audience, oh my God, I love England, what a great country, your castles, you, yeah. you're great people, you're so much more spiritual, you're so much more... The audiences don't like it. But if you go to America and you say, America, you know, you... Well, look, I've performed in America, not much, just a few times. Yeah. The audiences are very, uh, uh, how would you put it, uh, vocal. Yeah. Very I mean, they cheer at anything, and they laugh at anything. Yeah, because they paid money, they want to enjoy themselves. You so people, it's capitalist, the... that's what it is. It's, it's, you pay, I don't know, that's it's not just, the right word. No, it's it's a, not it's capitalist. A... You pay money, you're going to get your money's worth. I don't think it's Americans that, are going to get their money's worth. I love that you can psychoanalyze an entire I've nation. I've thought about it, I've been here for 23 years yeah. already. I've had too much of you people. You know, you, you need to be a comedian, you need to be a performer. Something inside you, you know, is screaming out for attention. No. No, I could do lots of things. I've done other things, and I've done other things well. I sold advertising space, I was an estate agent. Were you? Yeah, I did lots of other things. The Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese, on GB News. I have here someone who needs no introduction, so I'm not going to give him one. Chris. Well, I Thank thought you'd you give me a build-up saying one of the most gifted broadcasters in the world. All right, he is one History of the, the most world. gifted broadcasters what I've ever the had the pleasure to meet, I think oh, we can what say. What I've ever world. had the pleasure to meet. Thank you. <laughs> Chris, thank you for doing this. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm a bit puzzled why there are three live cats and a dead pine martin on the table, but... Well, because people love cats, and I love cats. They don't seem to like pine martins. Well, that's very strange. Stuffed. That's a stoat. Oh. Do you know how you can take the tell the difference between a stoat and a weasel? Well, the weasel is weaselly identified because the stoat's totally, totally different. different. Yeah. Now... Tell me your story about these Um <laughs> I have a very good relationship with some journalists. Yeah. Um, yeah. Done interviews with some of them time and time again because they're decent, honest folk. I've also had periods of my life when I've been surrounded by journalists who I didn't like very much and paparazzi popping up. They actually did once go through my dustbins, I remember. 
Really? Well, there's nothing there, a lot of old fish But this bait. was when you were a huge star. Yeah, with, um... well, I think it started... Thank you. What a nice man. I think when Who Wants to Be a Millionaire started, and we were sponsored by the Sun newspaper. Sponsored by the Yeah, well. so we got written about very nicely in the Sun, obviously. Yeah. Um, but all the others were trying to dig some dirt up about me, about the show, about it's all a crook or whatever. Um, so not information, but dirt? Just, just dirt, really, to, yeah. you know, knock me off in pedestal and knock, knock the show off its pedestal. It was huge. I mean, when it, Millionaire started, it was just colossal. It was the number one. That was probably... I mean, I was very naive. Sorry, I've just stood on the cat. Um, <coughs> I was very naive. <laughs> but I think then the sort of phone hacking was starting because there were... You know that strange thing when you're talking to someone on the phone and you, you sort of think there's somebody else listening? I never had that experience. Oh, yeah, I've had that. Because you used to have those things like tied lines and things. And I thought... I never, I never said anything about it. I just thought it was, you know, a rubbish phone that I was using. And then when I split from my wife, I mean, it became just open season. And they were everywhere. You know, they were trying to get at my children. They were obviously trying to talk to my ex-wife. They were trying to get at your children. Yep. And it was only later that I... I began to realise that this hacking lark was actually taking place on my phone. So I had no... I'd never... I'd heard of it. I thought it something that happened to somebody else that happens in Hollywood. Well, we thought it was the, the world of spies. Yeah. Mm. So, eventually, the police came to me, actually, and there was a gentleman called Glenn Mulcair, or Mulcair mm -hmm. from News of the World, uh, and on his blotter in his, in his office were all sorts of phone numbers of various people and whatever, but CT, my name... Um, was was by my mobile phone number, my landline at home, and also my texts. And they said... And, and the guy eventually went to prison. I mean, he, he, was, he was done for it and he was banged up for... For not, what? For having your number? I don't understand. Not just having my number, no, because he was, he was found guilty of hacking all sorts of people. Lots and lots and lots of people were hacked. There were periods when, for example, Jim, my driver, is an enormous, wonderful, big bear of a man, lovely guy, huge... Um, and he's been with me for 20, 25 years. And one of my closest friends, the kids all love him. He's just a really good guy. And there was one particular night when I was separated. I took a lady out. I met her for um, a drink, so then we went for dinner. And there were sort of photographers everywhere we went. And this, this carried on through the night and through the next morning when I took her to work and so on. And that evening, we'd, we'd done um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire up at Elstree. And when we were driving home... I said to Jim, I can't understand this. How did they know so much detail about where I was going? I mean, uh -huh. it was quite extraordinary, because the only person I talked to was Jim on the phone. And Jim turned to me, great big lump with tears in his eyes. He said, you've got to think it's me. Oh. And I said, you know, I love you, mate. I do think it was you. I can't... There's nobody else. There's no it? other explanation. Right. Yeah. It was only really... And our relationship was pretty grim for quite a long time. As a guy I love, I trusted this guy literally with everything. And he knew so much about me, you know, because we'd, we'd spent hundreds of hours together driving home mm. late at night from TV mm. studios, whatever. I think one of the most awful things about this, and people think, oh, there's a celebrity and he's having a bad time, but all the closest relationships yeah. are broken up because the only assumption is not that you've been hacked, but yeah. because this person you've known all these years yeah. is, is talking yeah. to the press. It's appalling. I know. and it, it was with Jim, obviously, but also with my friends, my kids. I didn't trust anybody for weeks no, no. until eventually a pattern emerged. I went, oh, my God, that's what's been happening. A horrible time. I mean, it also became a kind of sport because they were just everywhere. I mean, literally, as I say, they were looking at my dustbins. I mean, what are you going to find a bloke's dustbin, a pair of soiled pants or whatever? God knows. Bless them. I mean, they were always, always following Jim in my car and a lot of the time I spent on the back with a blanket over my head. I mean, it was quite bizarre the whole period. Um, but also, quite often, we would switch cars... So Jim would go off with a blanket in the back over a sort of like, <laughs> probably a pillow. Oh, really? he took him miles. He took him from Elstree Studios once, convinced that I was in the back of this car, almost down to Canterbury. <laughs> and he, and he, got, he, he got out and parked up. And, of course, went in for a cup of coffee in a service session. And they all ran to the car, knocking on the window. And went, <laughs> there? There's nobody there. <laughs> so it did become a sport. My favourite my favorite moment that I remember from all this is that Jim lives down in Dartford. And, he's, as I say, he's a big old boy. And he got home quite late one night. He dropped me off somewhere and, and went home. And he was sort of on his way to getting into bed. And 
There was a knock on the door. Hello, Mr Luck. And he went, uh, yeah, what is it? It's, you know, I'm trying to sleep. Uh, it's the Sun newspaper here, Mr Luck. We've got a cheque here for £5,000. Someone's going to get it. We want a story about Chris Tarrant. Someone's going to get it. Might as well be you. And Jim went, oh, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I waited for a couple of minutes, and the door burst open. And Jim's holding... Now, Jim is in a vest. He's got his trousers on, he's in a vest, so it's a pretty scary sight. He's got this huge chunk of wood in his hand. And they're going, what are you doing? What are you doing? He went, well, got a chunk of wood here. Somebody's going to get it. It might as well be you. <laughs> and they ran down the street like scalded bunnies. One of the things I remember vividly, because I think it's such a great expression, I was talking to Phil Collins, who'd had a really very bad time with the press chasing him yeah. and, you know, all sorts of intrusion, whatever. And I said, do you think these guys, because they're doing... Some of them are doing really illegal, dirty things. Yeah. Not all of them, but some of them. And I said, do you think they actually realise, you know, the, the hurt they're causing? And Phil said, he said, the trouble is, they've been down in the so long, they can no longer smell it. Uh, Which is an unpleasant idea, but actually, it's, no, it's spot right. on. It just becomes yeah. the way you do things. And you day. forget about the moral yeah. thing, yeah. 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 It's yeah. Drinking, drinking your gin. It's going to be a very happy cancer. <laughs> <laughs> when you said, do you know... Plenty of journalists were decent guys. This yeah, is yeah. true. Absolutely. But the, the real pressure, the real villains, I think, are the editors, because the editors basically say to them, if you don't do this, you're fired. And they've got a wife and kids and a mortgage, yeah. right? Absolutely. So it's the, it's the editors who seem to me to be the really evil ones. And, of course, they you never hear about them because they preserve a kind of anonymity. Yeah. But I feel that, uh, that they must basically be sociopaths to have so little care for other people's feelings. None at all. I just hope that slowly it's getting better, but there are more and more famous people who are fair game because all this sort of reality... There are so many people now. Yeah. When you started, when I started, there weren't that many famous people. At all. And there was this now. atmosphere. And they actually but quite like it. that was before Murdoch bought yeah. the News of the World. It, ever since then. Yeah. And there, there is this feeling, which I certainly have never subscribed to, like... Do you if think you're it's all the right phone... if I sit out of this or what I get <laughs> well, some of the cat's licked it, you're very welcome. I just have a cat's tongue in it. It'd probably be OK. Well, it's gin, anyway. Yeah. Oh, here he comes again. Oh, thank you. He's a bit of a nuisance, isn't he? He's a very intrusive, man. I don't know. I don't know where he comes he's from. Like me, much I. He's, um, he's a sort of maitre d' around here, but we very unpleasant sort of guy. We'll cut this bit out. Well. Right. I'm going to talk to the director. Of I that. think there are people now who just like being famous. So if you're on the front page of one of the tabloids, even if you're being absolutely vilified, it's like look at me, look at me on front page today. <laughs> yes, but it says you had sex with your mother. It don't matter, mate. I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. I'm up in lights. I think there is quite a lot of that now. Well, thank you very much for coming. My I really pleasure. appreciate your talking to me. God bless. So, uh, the last person I'm going to talk to today is Mr Ian Lucas. Hello there. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, Ian is a, a lawyer, but none the worse for that. And he was also an MP, a Labour MP, for 19 years for Rex. Around that. But I, I kind of fell in love with you because <laughs> I saw a clip on the internet where you were cross-examining um, Hancock, Matt Hancock, about uh, a statement that he made in the House of Commons which seemed to be rather misleading. Let's, let's have a look at it. I decided that the best thing is not to have a back. I know what your inquiry, position is. But, but what I'm saying to you okay, is I... that is that you mis misrepresented Sir Brian yeah. Leveson's position to the Commons on that day. Well, that's your view. We're not going to come to agreement on it. I think I faithfully represented it as set out, as as you read out. And um, uh, but I I I I I, un I understand. I, I can see that you would rather have I'd done it differently? No, what I would rather would, would be that you were straightforward. Yeah. Now, I'm a lawyer, OK? Yes. I know when particular words are drafted for particular purpose, purposes, and I think your words were drafted to mislead. Well, That's what I think. Well, uh, I, I, all I can say... And what I would have preferred would be if you'd quoted Sir Brian Leveson when he said that he fundamentally disagreed 
I with, can, the, with the conclusion that the government had reached. I can see that, that was your, that that's your preference. Yeah. I wrote my speech yes. in order to describe his position. My preference, and Secretary of State, is that. honesty and straightforward that's right. evidence. That's right. And I would really welcome that from you. Noted. I thought that was quite wonderful. What's extraordinary is that this is the first time I've been asked to speak about this. Why? No one was interested, no one covered it. And Matt Hancock, after that interview, uh -huh. believe it or not, was promoted. <laughs> there was very, very limited coverage about the, the interview at the time. But of course, remember, this was about the press, yeah. which I think is not coincidental. Ah, so Leveson 2, let's talk about Leveson 2, because it seems to me, and I'm not well enough informed, that we badly need that. Tell me. I think we do. What Leveson 2 is about is the relationship between the press and the police. And this was an essential part of the Leveson inquiry. Remember that it was set up in uh, around the Millie Dowler uh, yes. uh, controversy and... Uh, and we were able then to investigate uh, with the press, and this is what Leveson 1 was about, the newspapers and what steps they'd been taken. But Leveson 2 could not proceed because there were a number of criminal trials that were happening oh, and yeah. had to finish before we could look into the, the detail of the relationship between the police and the press. And we know from uh, the parliamentary inquiry that took place in around 2003, that Rebecca Brooks admitted to a parliamentary inquiry that they bought inf the Sun bought information from the police. That that was admitted to Chris Bryant way back. Nothing was done about that. Nothing until the Dowler uh, incident happened, and it was only then that it was picked up some seven eight years later. What else is there in Leveson 2 that people should be rooting for? Well, they should be looking at issues like the ownership of newspapers, oh. about the connections that, that there are with, with people who own the biggest newspapers that we read every, every, every day, but actually don't live in Britain. <laughs> no, I know. There's a small world in, in, in British politics uh, that is closely connected to newspapers. Yes. And when something like my interview with Matt Hancock happens, yes. I think that there are connections that are made uh, that prevent the wide dissemination mm. of information like that. I think the government needs to look at the ownership of newspapers, introduce rules and laws that other countries have. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't be a bad idea, And, 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 and <laughs> that, that would enable um, the, us to have a, you know, a wide-ranging, open press expressing different points of view from different right. ends of the political spectrum that, that, that would enable us to have a sensible debate in, in, in the newspapers. A proper democratic debate, yeah in a way that we just don't have at the moment. Ian, shut up. <laughs>
next time on the Dinosaur Hour. I, I see these, you know, trans women are real women. No, you're not, okay? That's the bottom line. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? <laughs> well, <laughs> she cost me 20 million. Oh. I want to know what you really feel about woke. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. Join me, Mark Dolan, Fridays and Saturdays from 9, Sundays from 10. Only on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. There's only three people you can trust in life. Your doctor, your lawyer, and your nana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. So join me, Nana Aquaria.